Hello, I'm chair of the Save Weems Ancient Cave Society and usually when talking about Weems we concentrate on the Pictish symbols and with good reason of the known 60 or so Pictish symbols in caves over 80% are here at Weems but what I want to do in this talk is look at some of the other carvings we have those which are either poorly understood or in some cases largely ignored Lockdown presented an opportunity to step back a little and have a look at these in more detail including research into some of the earlier investigations at the site and it gave us time to re-examine and test some of those earlier observations against new digital techniques. I should say in advance that these are my own views or their new ideas developed alongside other people and so shouldn't be taken as a collective SWAX view. They range from the highly conjectural to those that I have much more confidence in and the period they cover ranges from the Bronze Age to the early Christian activity of the first millennium. Now I'm far from a specialist in any of these areas, so one of the outcomes I'm hoping for is to get feedback from any of you who are watching who are specialists. So, and if there are any pot shots you'd like to take at what I'm about to say, please go ahead in the question and answers. So these are the carvings I'm going to be talking about. Firstly, the now lost carvings in the Michael Cave, a cup and ring mark and an associated hunting scene. The symbol commonly known locally as Thor and his goat, which is in the Court Cave Passage. A human figure in Jonathan's Cave. And finally, what's known as the Viking Boat, also in Jonathan's Cave. So firstly, a very brief introduction to the site for background. It's a coastal area of Fife, around 30 miles north of Edinburgh, and roughly the same distance southwest of St Andrews. The caves are marked in pink, together with the medieval Macduff Castle on this map. Now these caves are all on the east side of the village, but originally there were also caves on the west side, which is where I want to start. So on this side of the village stood the Glass Cave, which is the, or was the second oldest commercial glassworks in Scotland, operational in the 17th century, but has long since collapsed. And also in this area was another cave, undocumented until 1929 and now known as the Michael Cave. It's known as the Michael Cave because it was on the site of the Michael Colliery and we're indebted to local antiquarian George Dees, who undertook some emergency rescue archaeology in 1929 when he was notified that work on a new boiler room for the colliery had exposed these rock carvings in the then inaccessible cave. On the left is a classic cup and ring mark so probably Bronze Age in date and I'm not really going to say much about that apart from to observe that although there are one or two examples of cup and ring marks from what are really rock shelters just overhangs this is the only known example as far as I can ascertain of a cup and ring mark from within the interior of a cave in Britain. Next to the cup and ring mark is a large panel of carvings and that's what I want to, to concentrate on. Both these findings were published in the Proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries in 1933 in an article by Arthur Edwards. And Edwards sought the advice of um, some colleagues um, the Abbe Bruy, no less, in Paris, and Professor James Ritchie of Aberdeen University. And I'll just read an extract from the article. The Abbe Bruy, in his reply, said he thought that two animals might be re represented, the upper being a long-horned beast and the lower uncertain. Professor Ritchie wrote, I make the tentative suggestion that the cave sculpture may represent a hunting scene, portraying an elk being attacked by a man, but it's simply punctuated lines are very rude and therefore difficult to interpret and I am at a disadvantage in that I did not see the actual specimen and have to depend upon the photograph. The form of the long-horned animal is I think pretty definite and I interpret this as an elk. And Edwards goes on to say if the suggestion of elk is correct and the picture is contemporary with the Bronze Age cup and ring markings the technique of which is similar the record is a unique one for Britain. Now I was prompted to go back and look at what had been said about the carvings in the Michael Cave by the discovery earlier this year of animal carvings in Kilmartin Glen. 
which got a lot of publicity and were indeed a fantastic find. But to read from the press release of um, Historic Environment Scotland, prehistoric animal carvings thought to be between 4,000 and 5,000 years old have been discovered for the first time in Scotland. These are the earliest known animal carvings in Scotland and the first clear examples of deer carving from the Neolithic to Early Bronze Age in the whole of the UK. Now, when I introduced the talk, um, I, I talked about I was looking at carvings that had been less well understood or overlooked. And I'd like to make the case really that these really ought to be looked at again. And perhaps the Kilmartin Glen carvings are not the first time in which carvings of this type have been discovered in Scotland. The tragedy here is that, as alluded to in the article in the proceedings of the society, the originals weren't available to be examined. And the reason for that was because George Dees only had a very limited time to make a study and a recording of the carvings. And the image that I produced is the only one that we have because the cave was due to be filled in by concrete. And tragically, that's what happened. He did have time to make a, a cast of the cup and ring mark, but unfortunately we have nothing similar of the um, animal carvings. So we don't have access to the original carvings. We only have this, um, we have two pictures to go on. The one that I'm showing here is um, one that was enhanced at the time to try and bring out what they thought were the um, deliberately made incisions on the rock. Um, but nevertheless, I think the suggestion put forward back in 1933 that at the time this was a carving unique to Britain is one that ought to be taken seriously and, and, and given serious thought in the light of the latest discovery in Kilmartin Glen. I'm going to turn now to look at our second carving. This is the figure known as Thor and his goat, which is located in the Cork Cave Passage. I'm going to use the Weems Caves 4D website to demonstrate where it is. So this is the entrance to the, to the passageway. And if we go in a few yards, then here's the image on the left. It's picked out in green and notice this large niche next to it, which I'm going to come back to later. This is a reflectance transformation imaging model of the carving. Uh, I can move the light and so you can view it from from different angles and this is how it was recorded historically so this is a photograph from Romilly Allen of 1890. Now although it's known locally as Thor and his goat we've always been very confident that that's not what it represents but far less certain about what it what the correct identification might actually be. Um, I think though that we're now in a position where we can move that along a few years ago, Joanne Hambly of the Scape Trust made the observation in the Picture Art Society newsletter of spring 2016 that it is a club carrying figure accompanied by an animal that has been identified as Thor but bears a strong resemblance to a Romano British figure carved on living rock in Northumberland. And this is the carving she was talking about. It's at Car Edge near Chester's Fort and was discovered back in 2006. So Joe described it as similar to that figure, um, but didn't really p pursue that any further. Um, but it's since been noticed, particularly by um, Helen Mackay, who attended a meeting I gave where I mentioned this carving in passing for, uh, again for the Picture Art Society. And she put forward a theory that has been since picked up um, by Dr. Kelly Pil Kilpatrick. And if anybody saw, um, attended the Pictures Art Society conference in October, uh, they'll know what I'm about to say here. But it's been pointed that they pointed out that this isn't the only depiction of, of that figure. We've also got this one. We've got this one. And we've got this one from a silver plaque. And these are all found along uh, in, in Cumbria and Northumbria along the line of, of Hadrian's Wall.
If we put our Weems figure next to those, then there's a very striking, I think, similarity between what we have on these images and what we have at, at, at Weems. Now, fortunately, we know who, exactly who the other images are because it tells us not just on this plaque on the right hand side, but on a whole series of shrines and dedications along the wall. And this is the Romano-British god Cacidius. Cacidius is always depicted in this face on stance with his arms outstretched and is usually shown carrying a spear with a distinctive doorknob spear butt. Both of these characteristics are clearly visible on the figure that we have at Weems. Although there are some differences with our figure to some of the representations. In particular, we're lacking a shield unless we consider that the strange angle of the arm on the right hand side is somehow intended to represent that. Cacidius was identified by the Romans with Mars, the god of war, but not only with Mars, he was also identified with Sylvanus, the god of forests and hunting. And in one or two depictions, along Hadrian's wall he's also shown in this forest aspect and if our identification of the figure at Weems with Cacidius is correct then that's what we might be seeing here with the inclusion of the animal to the right of the figure. This hunting or forest aspect for Cacidius is mainly found towards the east of Hadrian's wall with the martial aspect more closely concentrated towards the west. Most of the representations we have are thought to have been made by Roman soldiers. Some of them are very finely executed in relief carving, but others are thought to have been made by local people. So what we're seeing is the co-option of a British god into the Roman pantheon, but in turn the adoption of techniques such as carving by local people. It's long been recognised the great cultural influence that contact with the Roman world had on societies further north. And I don't think it would be surprising that we see something like this at Weems, given the scale of the contact that we know that areas like Fife had, um, evidenced by the quantities of silver being brought in during the, the first centuries of the Roman occupation, and in fact the development of Pictish carving itself. Before I leave the discussion of this carving, I just want to draw your attention to the figure on the silver plaque in the bottom right, where the figure of Cacidius appears to be standing inside a niche. Now there's another site um, in Northumbria called South Yard Hope, which has been identified as a shrine to Cacidius. There's a carving uh, of the god there, but what is a natural chamber also has been modified to create a, a hearth a low, and a low bench. And so the idea of modifying natural sites in order to create what would probably have been a new idea of worshipping or, or dedication to a deity inside an enclosed space seems to be one that's happening at South Yard Hope. And I'll conclude by returning to the 4D Weems Caves website and again to show the location of the carving and this niche that I mentioned at the beginning. And I'd just like to put out there the possibility that this niche that we know nothing about, we've never really had an understanding what it might be. There have been various theories that it might be a, um, might have been used for metalworking, it might have been a cupboard, there's a hole in the bottom here which would allow for a rope or a bellows to pass through. Is this associated more closely with the carving than we previously thought? And could it actually be a niche associated with the worship of Cacidius? Okay. So we're now going to go to Jonathan's cave. And in particular, this section of the cave here. Now this section is very damaged and possibly because it doesn't contain any symbols and it's very unclear what's going on has attracted very little attention in recent times. We've tended to describe this bit to the right as a front of an animal and the section on the left as possibly a human figure without giving much thought to what that really means. So in part prompted by a meeting that John Borland did for us about representations of warriors in Pictish art, 
we decided to have a much closer look at what's there. These are the earliest representations of what was there in the mid 19th century, described at the time by James Young Simpson as already much faded. The figure is mentioned and discussed over the next 40 years by other antiquarians and archaeologists, but frustratingly none of them can agree on what they see or even what actually physically remains. Now human figures in early Pictish art are exceedingly rare, but there is a class which is known as the Pictish Spearman. By the time the Weems figure was noticed, only Rhiney III was definitely known, and it's not entirely clear when Westerton was discovered, but none of the discussion around the figure at Weems makes any reference to the Pictish Spearman. And nobody makes any reference to our figure in subsequent discussion of the carvings at Weems since John Patrick in the early 20th century. It's essentially forgotten about. However, since the figure at Weems was first noticed and suggested to be a human figure, there have been two more notable finds. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the Tullock Stone, but in the discussion of these, again, no mention was made of the figure at Weems. So, is this one of the figures? This is the result of our high-resolution photogrammetry, so we can study it more closely. You have to disregard the tail end of the fish here because that is definitely a modern addition. But looking at this model very closely, one or two things do stand out. Notably, there is an arm here, which nobody mentioned in their early observations, and possibly even a spear running vertically. Now, this is all very much open to interpretation, and the damage is such that it's certainly possible to imagine all sorts of things. And the model is available on Sketchfab for anyone that wants to look more closely. If you look at our figure in comparison with the other known figures, then there are differences and similarities. First, he's facing the wrong way, but in that all the other carvings are, are facing, uh, they're walking right to left. But one thing we have at Weems is that many of our carvings are not quite right in comparison with more formalized symbols on monumental stones. Our double discs and floriated rods are in strange orientations, for example. But the similarity of the body form, the legs and particularly of the head, means that I think at the very least we should be serious to considering this as part of that collection of carvings elsewhere, and perhaps even a very early example and even ancestral to them. Now, Kelly Kilpatrick, in her talk for the Pictures Art Society conference, suggested that this warrior figure may even be another example, a later example, of the Cachidius that we discussed earlier. I'll say nothing about that, but her talk is of, should be available online, and hopefully you'll go and have a look at that and consider um, whether that's a plausible suggestion. The final carving I'm going to look at is the one known as the Viking Boat, which is also located in Jonathan's Cave. I firstly want to deal with the question of the authenticity of the boat as a genuine early medieval carving. This has arisen largely due to the fact that the boat wasn't recorded until 1906 when it was described and photographed by John Patrick, and none of the other 19th century scholars who recorded the carvings appear to have described anything similar in Jonathan's cave. However, Patrick himself was in no doubt that it was contemporaneous with the other carvings in Jonathan's cave, and he noted that James Young Simpson, when he visited 40 years previously, had described a strikingly similar figure, but had placed it in Dew Cave. Simpson described a large figure with an irregular head, an elongated body, and six limbs stretching downwards. The dimensions that Simpson gave were virtually identical to those of the boat in Jonathan's cave. And he even remarked, perhaps it is intended as the figure of a boat. Patrick was unable to find any figure matching Simpson's description in Dew Cave, and it was never recorded by anybody else. We also know that Simpson made mistakes in his documentation of the site, not least in the very name of the cave itself, which he ascribed to a nail maker called Jonathan, who had worked in the cave, whereas locally it had always been known as Cat Cave or Factor's Cave, and Jonathan's Cave was in fact elsewhere on the site. So the most likely explanation is simply that Simpson did observe this figure, but ascribed it to the wrong location. There's a fuller discussion of this in 
the age of migrating ideas in a chapter by Ritchie and Stevenson from 1993. Another reason for doubting the authenticity of the carving is the fact that it's pecked rather than incised and is on the opposite wall to all the other carvings in Jonathan's cave. However, I want to make the argument that far from this being a reason to doubt its authenticity, it actually strengthens it when we look at the position of the boat and its style in relation to other carvings towards that end of the cave. So we'll just fly into Jonathan's cave using the 3D models that we made um, and all the Pictish symbol carvings and some animal figures are along this left hand side of the cave where it's brightly lit. So this is the rear of the cave and I've circled the position of the boat in red. Just beyond this point, the roof of the cave lowers quite significantly, creating a much smaller space, and the acoustics in this area are noticeably different to the rest of the cave. We can't say exactly how this would have worked in early medieval times, because the floor layer is probably a metre or to a metre and a half higher than it would have been then. But today it is certainly a much quieter and darker space than the main body of the cave. Running all the way along the back of the cave, there is a natural shelf which contains a large number of early Christian crosses. We've counted at least 15 of these, most of which are very badly damaged, but it's possible that there may have been others here that we can no longer recognise. So this is clearly a focus for early Christian activity, either being used by missionaries contemplatively carving crosses into the rock or even as an early place of worship predating stone or wooden churches. Directly opposite the boat on the other side of the cave also at the threshold to this rear section there are three more very prominent crosses. These take the pedestaled and trident forms found in other early medieval cave contexts particularly in western Scotland and for more information on that, see Ian Fisher's Early Medieval Sculpture in the West Highlands and Islands. So I began to consider whether the position of the boat directly opposite these crosses and the possible association with them by virtue of them basically flanking the entrance to this lower area meant that perhaps the boat might have an early Christian interpretation. Now, representations of boats are very few and far between in Pictish art. In fact, there is only one other apart from this possible example at Weems, and that's on the Cosson Stone, also known as the St Orland Stone. And I'll talk about that one in a moment. There is one other example that could be interpreted as human interaction with the sea, and that is on what's known as the Priest Stone from Papil. This depicts figures on foot and one on horseback arriving at a cross and it has been suggested that the very unusual spiral pattern used as a grounding for the figures could represent their arrival by sea and be taken in some way to, 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 to be symbolic of Christianity arriving in the area. This is a proposal made in 1973 by Charles Thomas. I think a more useful comparison, if we are to suggest that this boat is associated with the early Christian era in Scotland, is to look more closely at the Cosson stone. While the Weems boat is more elongated and shallower than the Cosson stone boat, I think it's worth drawing attention to the fact that there are six figures on the Cosson stone, one of whom has a steering oar steering the boat to its destination and at Weems we have six oars and a figure at the front also taking grasp of a steering oar. So could they be telling the same story? Kelly Kilpatrick in the presentation that I referred to earlier put forward a very convincing argument that whilst cross slabs such as the Cosson Stone are clearly Christian monuments they nevertheless incorporate mythology and ideas that derive from pre-Christian times and are telling stories that would be recognisable to a newly Christianised people 
and that the message itself may not necessarily be contradictory with Christianity but complementary to it. So can what we have at the back of Jonathan's cave with the elements of the crosses and the boat be seen in some way as a precursor to stones such as the one at Cossons where they're combined together more formally and to such great effect? That's all I have time for. We've shone a light on a long forgotten carving that was perhaps of national importance and unique at the time it was discovered. We've maybe gone some way to making a firm identification of a British god on the walls of the Cork Cave Passage. Perhaps in plain sight all along there was a rare depiction of the Pictish spearman and maybe seen the first stir stirrings of the iconography that would go on to become so refined on cross slabs in later centuries. As I said at the beginning, some of this is more secure than others and I'd really welcome any observations, any criticisms or perhaps even dare I say some support for some of the ideas that I've put forward. Thanks very much for watching.